You are listening to the Independent Dealer Podcast with hosts Luke Godwin and Jeff Watson. Hello and welcome to the Independent Dealer Podcast brought to you by Buckeye Dealership Consulting. Uh, This is our most favorite time of the year and not just because it's Christmas and we get gifts and a lot of time off, but because in the month of December, we do our How I Built This series. Yeah, Jeff, it's uh, so much fun. Uh, we, we get to uh, meet other dealers that we don't always get to run into. Uh, we get to interview some some of our friends that we've uh, actually made really good connections with. And we also get to bring the stories to our audience that they don't get to hear. Uh, we get to hear a lot of these things. But uh, um, there are lessons to be to learn from, uh, to, to do the things that these dealers are doing. And there's also some cautionary tales to not do the things dealers are doing. So yeah, over the so next often, four weeks, we're bringing it to you. We are going to bring it, Luke, because so often you see these dealerships and you see dealers and you're like, wow, that guy is just successful. He's just got it made. He's got it figured out. He must have just been born that way. And we don't realize how much goes into it, how many hard knocks and how many near bankruptcies and how many just sometimes dumb luck goes into it. So I, I love hearing the stories behind you know, the the dealer, the name, things like that. So we're going to kick it off this week with our good friend, Ben Wheat. Luke, introduce Mr. Ben to the group. Ben, ben is uh, someone we met a couple of weeks ago when we were in Indy and um, he owns Indy Wholesale Direct, uh, one of the coolest facilities I've ever been in and uh, one of the nicest guys uh, we've ever met on the road. So Ben, introduce yourself. Hey guys, uh, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, again, my name is uh, Ben Wheat, and I am the owner, operator, president, what have you, of uh, an independent dealership in Carmel, Indiana, north side of Indianapolis, Indy Wholesale Direct. It's it's a phenomenal uh, store, Ben. How many cars are are you selling, and what is your your mix? Uh, subprime, prime. You're a retail dealer. What are you doing there? So we've got we've got a, a pretty eclectic eclectic mix of inventory. We've got cars, you know, we try to keep most of the trades. So we've got stuff, you know, we've got $5,000 cars and we've got, you know, $200,000 cars, but typically, you know, our inventory falls in the range of let's say 10 to maybe $40,000. And we usually stock about 250 to 300 cars, uh, typically online, maybe 200. There's usually about 50 in some stage of recon. And per month, we like to sell maybe we usually fall 120 to 150 units retail. Mm. And uh, man, how that many is an ho- operation. Yeah. How many wholesale on top of that? Because it, it sounded like we were up there. You were doing a lot of wholesaling as well. Yeah. So it depends. It depends on the time of year, um, really. And, you know, uh, this time of year, you know, we were talking uh, before we went on about, you know, we are, you know, selling, you know, we're blowing out some old age stuff. You know, it's the end of the year. So we're kind of, you know, we're looking at our numbers and, uh, you know, talking to our to our accountants, things like that. And so we are we are wholesaling quite a bit the last quarter. Uh, I would say, you know, especially this month, we, we may wholesale as many as 100 cars this month. Hmm. Um, a lot of times, you know, we'll find ourselves with and I'm sure you guys have this as well. There'll be a, a car that's been on the back row for six months. and You, uh, you know, you just you're never going to get around to fixing it. It may need an engine, may need a transmission. So you just decide it's time. Let's just take it to the auction and say goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. I think all of us end up and and us, the ones who don't do that end up with a pile of junk like Jeff and, um, and, <laughs> and he's, he just got a bunch of uh, cash sitting on, on the back lot. But, but Ben, the one thing I found very unique about your facility and don't get me wrong, it gets cold in Indy. So having uh, an inside dealership is, it's something else. Can you describe your dealership to the to the listeners? Guys, it's tax time. That means you've got to get signed up with TaxMax right now. You can start running the fourth quarter program for TaxMax, filing people's taxes in, in, in advance, getting an estimate, and then getting that money sent directly to your dealership now with the fourth quarter program. So we've started it at my dealership where we've reached out to all of our, you know, uh, priority customers or some of our best customers that might want to upgrade or trade in early. And we're giving that that as an option. Yeah, it's always uh, good to have. It's an extra tool in the kit. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. It, whether it's a lender, whether it's uh, a floor plan company, whatever, you need those extra tools to get those extra deals done. Tax Max is the way to go. Um, they're there for us. They will help you. There's also a, a code in the in the show notes. Check them out. 
Yeah, it's VIP. Use the code VIP to get 40% off when you sign up for their VIP package. And the coolest thing they're doing right now is the click to file. So you actually don't have to do the taxes in your dealership. Your salesmen don't have to take the time to physically punch in the numbers. The customers can just click a banner on your website or you can text them over a link and they can file it from their phone. So while they sit at home, they can have all their taxes filed. They can do the whole thing. You show up the next morning and see that you've got a refund waiting to be credited to them and you can start selling them a car with that down payment. So it's a really, really cool program right now. Be sure to check them out, taxmax.com. Yeah, so our dealership is on about five acres. So it's a pretty large pretty large spot and we have a warehouse that is almost 100,000 square feet. So we keep the majority of our inventory uh, indoors and uh, it makes it really nice in the winter time. You know, your cars, you know, you're not scraping snow off of cars. Customers can shop, you know, in a, you know, climate controlled facility. Uh, you know, it also, uh, and we, we touched on this when you were there, it uh, really helps you with theft. You know, catalytic converter theft is a huge thing. So that helps us out there. Um, we've got a pretty big service department that's on one end, details on one end. It enables me to have everything under one roof, helps you keep tabs on everything, keeps the whole team together. You know, we don't have to have, you know, different spots for different things we can do. We've got our body shop, you know, all our recon, our repair facility, everything is under one roof. It's a very neat setup. Um, it, were you always that way? Were you always in a building like this? No. So, you know, 20 years ago when I first started, no, I mean, I had a tiny little, uh, uh, I think we, I think the term's a trap lot, you know, one, one way in one way out. It was actually an old gas station, uh, in Muncie, Indiana, but we had a facility on the other side of Carmel that was about, you know, maybe 5,000 square feet. Uh, we would keep maybe 30 cars inside. So, I mean, it, it was a nice place, great location, but, uh, um, a couple of years ago I was able to acquire this building and then, uh, um, it, it, it's been, it's been a great addition. It's really right. helped us a lot. Ben, give me a couple more scope of where you are now. And then what I want to do is rewind for dealers and talk about that trap lot that you started in. How many employees does it take to run the operation that you run? So right now, uh, I mean, it fluctuates between, I would say 30 to 35 employees typically. Okay. You know, we'll, we'll have, you know, salesmen, unfortunately they'll come, they'll go, it, you know, it, it depends. I mean, you know, we've got, you know, certain times we'll have, you know, you know, text will leave, text will, text will come, text will go. But typically, you know, 30 to 35 employees is typically wow. what we have. And that's, I mean, because you're doing everything. I mean, sales, some wholesale, financing, f and you got the repair shop, you got the body shop. You're doing it all start to finish. Now, are you buying all those cars or do you have people help you? So, you know, again, we were talking about this before we went on, but, uh, uh, we, uh, I had a buyer. I actually had two buyers. It, it became, um, it became so much work to manage them that it's just easier for, for me to do that. And besides obviously the trade-ins, I'm responsible for obtaining all of the inventory. Mm. Wow. Almost, yeah, almost exclusively. That's a full-time job. It is a full-time job. <laughs> and yet you still make it to the gym. Still go to the gym. Five <laughs> gym. I've got a gym at my house, though, so that makes it easier. So. Well, I, we're going to get into that because I want to talk about how you're creating those efficiencies to kind of multiply your time because you do some really unique stuff. Uh, but first off, Ben, so how did you even get started? Like, at what age and when did you say, hey, I, I want to sell used cars to people? What was the, were you in the industry? Did you grow up with a dealer family or was it just something where you said, hey, man, this looks like a lot of fun? No, so both uh, both my parents practice law. So no one in my family, to my knowledge anyway, has had any uh, any affiliation whatsoever with uh, with the car business. And I, you know, I I never really worked at a car dealership. Um, I started out. I had a my best friend, okay, um, in high school and in college. He worked at a, a dealership, American Chevrolet Cadillac in Muncie, Indiana. I went to Ball State. Um, and I was buying some trades off of their back row and I, uh, was making, you know, you and I talked about this. I was making, you know, I started selling these in at the time, Indiana auto and RV. This was before, uh, you know, all these websites this is before cars.com, even things like that. And I was selling maybe three, four cars a month and making really, really good money as a college kid. And after I graduated, I mean, I, I had my dealer's license when I was 21 years old. 
So I would, uh, you know, excuse myself uh, from a lecture and go talk to a customer about uh, about mm-hmm. a car. And I, uh, you know, for uh, after college, I, I made the decision to go to go to law school, actually, uh, for uh, for a year. And I was still you know, doing this just like I was in college. But after a year, I'd had enough. And I said, you know, I just this isn't what I enjoy. And then from that from that point on, I was, you know, Autom- uh, automotive business full time all the time. So did you did you jump straight from hey I'm I'm in law school one day to hey I I'm going to get a piece of property and I I'm going to do this. Well, I had rented so to uh, to have my dealer's license. I had rented a place, an old gas station uh, on Madison Street in Muncie, Indiana. Four hundred bucks a month is what I paid for this spot, and I maintained that spot uh, while I was in grad school. And, um, you know, I, again, I was selling, you know, three, four five cars a month, um, and just gradually, you know, built that up. And, uh, you know, just one day I, I just said, I can't do this anymore. And, uh, had the conversation with my parents. It was a tough conversation, you know, because, you know, they didn't really know, you know, there, there's a stigma, you know, that goes along with the car business and, you know, everybody, you know, it, it's, it's, it's seen as, uh, just kind of a, I don't know what word to use, but it's not, it's not maybe the most uh, glamorous, glamorous profession to, uh, to pursue. Well, I mean, that, that depends. hundred percent. Were, were your parents personal injury attorneys or were they corporate? No, attorneys? no, 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 no. Okay. They, uh, I grew up in a small town. My dad actually is a, is a circuit court judge in Steuben County, Indiana. He's the Oh, long- geez. He probably oh, wanted wow. to disown you. Yeah. In the state. No, he's been a judge since I was in the fourth grade. He's on wow. his second year. So oh my goodness. So you have been disowned. Did you have to change <laughs> no. your last name or do you still? No, have I did not. No, name? you know, you know, my mom and dad uh, have always been so supportive of everything I ever wanted to do. A- aviation, for example, like we talked about. I mean, whatever, whatever idea I had, they were behind me, uh, behind me 100 percent. So no chip on your shoulder when you said, hey, I'm going to I'm bailing on law school. I'm going to go do this year's car thing. Did you say, OK, Ben? Now I got to do this used car thing and prove to them that I can make a living flipping, you know, Chrysler's just as I could sitting behind a desk nine to five. So do you know what my dad said? I'll never forget this. I was at uh, I was at an auction in Indianapolis. And, you know, this is the day after we had had this conversation. He called me and uh, he asked me, you know, what can I do if that's what you want to do? Your mother and I talked and he asked me, you know, and instead of fighting me on it, he asked me what he could do to, you know, to make sure I succeeded. Hmm. Do you have them on retainer? I don't. <laughs> Do they review your legal documents? Oh, no, 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 no. But we, we, no, definitely, definitely never involved my mom and dad in any of that sort of stuff. So Ben, you, you tell your parents this, you leave, you leave law school um, and you're just all the way in the fire, right? You, you committed got, 100% you're, at that point. You're committed and you have this lot. At that point, did you start stocking up? I mean, because, you know, all of us know you can't make, you can't really make a living selling three to five cars a month. You can when you're in college, but you got to, you got to step it up now, right? Correct. Correct. So I started this. So basically my seed money, uh, originally I sold uh, the car. I I had a, uh, which I wish I still had. I had a 1997 BMW M3 and I sold my car. And whatever money I had, you know, uh, you know, I maybe had five grand in my bank account. So, I mean, I, I had, let's say 30,000 bucks to work with. And then my dad loaned me $30,000 as well. So, you know, I had 60,000 bucks, which at the time meant, let's say, you know, four to five cars. And then I did not have a floor plan uh, for over two years mm-hmm. of any type. So that's what I had for for, for two years. So let's say from the time I was 22 to the time I was 24 and I built that up, you know, I maybe increased that fivefold in two oh, wow. years. So, I mean, not bad, not bad. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a lot of money. And what year was this, Ben? This would have been, uh, 2004, 2005. Okay. So um, something, yeah. something with that though, that I think a lot of people get into trouble is that taught me how to be efficient and taught me, you know, the value of every dollar counts. Whereas I think a lot of people, if they go out and get a half million dollar floor plan line with AFC or next year, I think, you know, the kiss of death is taking on debt like that without any capital of your own. And I think that a lot of dealers have failed 
because of because of just that. I think one of the worst thing uh, a new dealer could do is um, is get a floor plan right out the gate. Uh, it, it's it's the recipe for disaster. I've seen so many people go and the first thing they do is buy a car that they want to drive. Right. Hundred um, percent. You read my mind. And put it on their floor plan. The next thing you know, that car is being repossessed. But you know, fast forward past that. Um, that's awesome that you were able to to take sixty thousand dollars and essentially turn it into three hundred thousand dollars in inventory in just several years. Uh, how long was it before you hit like the the twenty number? So I would say uh, the twenty number by the end of that two years, I I would say it'd be, it'd be a it'd be a it'd be safe to say that I was I was there at the end of that two years. Now, with that being said you know, that would be probably wholesale and retail because I would, you know, I, I was doing both, you know, and I was also, you know, I was buying cars off the street. I was buying cars at the auction. It just, you know, it really, when you don't have a lot, it really, really teaches you how to be efficient. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. You've got to hustle a lot. And, and, and to your guys' point earlier, when you talk about that, when it's your own money in the game, you're definitely you're you're scraping pennies. You're answering those late night text messages and emails to find that deal and to chase down that that one car that's a private party sale that's that's worth bringing on the lot. And you definitely lose that a little bit as you scale. At, at what point, Ben? Did you when, when did you start bringing on people? Like, were you doing twenty cars on your own, buying and selling? Like, yeah, when so did you start to add employees? Uh, I had a car trailer, so I would literally. I mean, I was a one man show. Now, you know, I. I would have, you know, it, a buddy would help me move a car. I mean, I'm not going to say that nobody ever helped me, but I definitely wasn't, you know, paying anybody any type of wage for that two years. I mean, it was me, you know, and then I'd always have a vehicle for sale that I could pull my trailer with. So mm. um, there was that. And I was moving all this stuff myself. And, you know, I'd be moving cars back and forth all night. And, um, and at the end of that two years, though, I hired a, uh, um, I guess you would call him a lot boy or a, or a helper or, you know, whatever. And I'll never forget. He, uh, he worked for, for $10 an hour, if that tells you, and he was a great employee for 10 bucks an hour, if that tells you how far back that is. And, uh, um, uh, from there, it was pretty much off to the races. And about that time is when I did get a floor plan. That's, you know, the jump from five cars a month to, to a hundred it, cars a month. That's it. That's huge. Um, along the way, you would have had to, to get your processes dialed in. At what point did you figure out that what you were doing by yourself was broke, like broken? Like, was it 20 cars a month? Was it 40 cars a month? Was it 60 cars a month? When do you, when did you realize that I've got to write this down? I've got to get people on board to help me get to that next level. So it just became it became impossible to to do anything more uh, without, you know, without employees and, and, and something else, you know, stuff would, you know, I would find myself, you know, with no way to possibly get everything done that I needed to get done. So then, you know, you're you're not able to maybe get this car moved or, you know, go to the auction because you got to do all this other stuff. And then there's always let's not forget, guys, at some point you have to meet customers, you have to sell cars you know, so that's a problem too. So then I found myself, you know, I, I'd be closed half the time, you know, my gate would be closed and then that was costing me business. And, you know, so really, I mean, if we're being honest, I probably should have, you know, maybe had some help before then, but it was just one of those things where I didn't want the expense and it doesn't sound like a lot, you know, the, the 10 bucks an hour, but I mean, I was literally, you know, obsessing over, you know, every dollar spent. I mean, I wanted to build that, you know, and I was literally, you know, building that up and I was being very conscientious of, of everything I was doing. Yeah. Do you remember, like, I find that interesting, you know, the first person you hire is kind of a lot attendant or a lot tech, someone to help you kind of move cars and shuffle stuff. Do you remember what the next couple of hires were? Like, what else did you delegate as you started to realize that you couldn't keep all those balls in the air? What were the things that you let go of first? So sales what was actually something that I met uh, a guy that had been in the car business for quite a while. And he actually had worked at that dealership that I was buying cars off of, uh, you know, years before. And that was great for me because it allowed me to go out 
and focus on, you know, buying cars, uh, you know, uh, you know, obtaining inventory. Um, I could go out and, you know, uh, build relationships, you know, buying used cars at the time, uh, you know, those days are pretty much over. But at the time, uh, you guys remember too, that you could go and buy these trades from these new car stores. And, you know, you could really, really get some good deals if you could build those relationships. And it just allowed me to step away from the lot so that I could actually, at that point, work from, you know, uh, what would seemingly be normal business hours. Whereas before I would spend, mo you know, most of the, the the late evening, you know, moving cars around and doing this and doing that because during the day I had to be at the I had to be at the dealership. Yeah, yeah. I think sense. sales. I think sales is the easiest thing to give up, right? Uh, yeah. Clerical stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think yeah, you have that, dealers that fall in two categories, right? It seems like you have some that are like, I am the salesman. I am the face. I can sell these cars better than anyone. Get top dollar. Get you know. And then you have a lot of dealers that also fall in the other category of I like to buy cars. I'm the buyer. You know, oh, I like to do that. <laughs> and I think that's where most of us fall, right? So, yeah. I think we'd argue that's the most important thing, right? The money's made in the buy. And that's yeah. almost the last thing that dealers can ever let go of is the acquisition part, right? 100%. And when you think about it, you know, there's something about if I buy a car and I make a mistake, that's on me. But it's really mm -hmm. hard for me. And it always has been to, you know, if I've got a buyer out there and he buys something and he makes a mistake that in my head I would have never made, it's very hard to get past that. You know, it, it really is. At least it's hard for me to get past that. And I believe that, you know, this isn't true, but I believe I can buy cars better than, you know, better than most people. So whether that's true or not, you know, you know, who knows? But ben, you I and I are, that. you and I are cut, cut from the same cloth. Um, and, and that's, it's, I, I don't ever have to sell another car in my life. Right. And, and so I've hired people to do that. And, and then I think the next thing is, okay, I've got to help. I've got to hire somebody to make sure my financials are, <clears throat> are, are where they need to be. Um, and then we just, you keep building that, that base of employees up until you have 30 employees or, or so. Uh, when, when did you, when did you make the, the jump from the small lot so did you go from that smaller lot to this place you are now, or was there a, a in between there? No, well, like I said, I went from the, the small lot to our initial location in Carmel on okay. this, not the lot that you guys were at, but the other building. And that was in 2010. Okay. Oh, back up. I, I, so for, for one year, I did have a, a slightly traditional lot. Um, that actually it was, uh, it was, it was in Indianapolis. It was, it was just, it's one suburb over from Carmel, uh, in Fishers. And, uh, it, it, it probably held 25, 30 cars, but I had both lots. So I guess I still had my lot in Muncie and I also had that lot. And I was using the lot in Muncie as like a holding, kind of like a holding lot, uh, just let it, I didn't have enough room because I was building this business up and I just ran out of space. And then I just decided it was just a, a random fluke thing where I had a family friend that was a realtor and she said, oh my God, I've got a space that's really, really nice. That's in Carmel. Uh, she knew the owner of this building and I went, checked it out and um, I leased the building. And uh, um, to this day, I actually still have that building. I, I keep some of my personal stuff in there, you know, boat stuff, uh, just cars that aren't for sale, things like that but it's a great location. And, uh, it, it really, it, it catapulted my business when I moved there because the demographic was, was great there as well. I mean, Carmel seems to be a, uh, a fluent, uh, an area, right? USA Today, number one, number one city in America. Hey everybody, real quick, just to jump in and make sure you guys are aware of Buckeye dealership consulting. And I say that like, you're not aware, of course you're aware. Uh, <laughs> Interesting, fun fact, the way we met Ben was through Buckeye Dealership Consulting, correct? It was. Um, it, I, You know, we didn't go in that. We didn't have time to, to go in that with Ben, but I know that he's really uh, selling that many cars and using reinsurance. It's just a way to to create a ton of money and, and you're not giving it to everybody else. So I, we can't stress enough. Go call Buckeye today, get it done. And that leads me to another idea. You're around all these new car stores, um, right. And around some really large independents, 
but you've decided to have all your inventory inside. You, you don't take advantage of of being on the outside, uh, uh, having the the traffic, I guess, uh, notoriety. You depend all on your cars being online and and your presence there. Is there any hesitation to to advise another dealer to do that, or you think it works fine for you? So I don't know what the exact metrics are, but you know, I I think it's something like you know, like 70% of people do, you know, 80% of their research before they ever even go look at a car. I mean, it's not like the old days where, you know, our, our kick tires. Would, yeah. Yeah. yeah like they'd go around to all the lots in town and, you know, kick tires and take a peek at what they had. Consumers, and we all know this, are doing their homework. They're doing their research. They're price shopping, you know, that they're doing their shopping ahead of time. And they're not just driving by and seeing something that's shiny and stopping and, and buying it. So, in my eyes, I would rather spend my money on, you know, this this indoor facility that could save me money in other ways, rather than have a location that may have a lot of frontage or may have more visibility. When in fact, I mean, really, what? How much of an advantage does that really give you? You know, being visible from the road like that. They get to see the front bumpers of your front row. Exactly. Right? You get to see the front <laughs> bumpers from exactly. It's, it's the, just it's been a real big shift in the last, you know. 10 years on this, mm -hmm. uh, nobody in their right mind would have a building like you had 10 years ago, right? Or not many people, but now it seems like to me, it makes a lot of sense. And I could even see buy here, pay here dealers going yeah. to this model. Cause that's, I mean, essentially Carvana is this model, right? Um, that you, they have a couple of dealerships, but if you do the pictures right and you have everything there, you, anybody can shop from anywhere. How, how many States are you selling cars to Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, in any given week, we may ship to 10 different states sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. we, you know, uh, obviously, you know, the the states bordering Indiana would be the most prevalent. But, you know, we've shipped just in the last couple of weeks. I know that we've shipped several cars to Florida. I know that we shipped uh, um, a one ton truck to Texas. So, I mean, we again, we ship cars. I know maybe a year or two ago, we shipped a car to Alaska. So, I mean, they go, it was, it was somebody in the military. So we go, uh, and, and, you know, we, we branch out to, to pretty much, pretty much everywhere. And, and that's the way I think most, most dealers are. Yeah. I'd be really interested to know the, the price, you know, if someone did a search in their, in their area, say you wanted an acre or two acres to, to get that land on a prime, you know, car row, what the cost would be as opposed to a covered warehouse off the beaten path. You know, I wonder if those are equivalent uh, cost per acre. I don't think you're going to find, you know, a, a, a piece of property that big, you know, on, you know, what, you know, every town has car dealer row, you know, in, in Indianapolis, it's, it's 96th street. And that's where all the dealerships are, at least on the North side. And to my knowledge, there's no, there's no properties that are, that are, you couldn't, you side. couldn't find what you have. You couldn't find there. At all, like just doesn't exist. No, and, and you know, I mean, there's uh, a few years ago there was an HH Greg, and you know that would be, you know, that property was on 96th Street, and it was actually sandwiched in between a couple car dealerships, and you know, I would guess that that probably sold for between fifteen and twenty million dollars. So, yes. and then you have to also build a building. Um, mm. Oh, this was not gonna. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, so it, it would be let's say five times as much. Mm. So you know, Jeff, that's a lot of money you can spend on internet advertising. Exactly. <laughs> Tron, I see your website. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, one thing we hadn't discussed is, is financing and, um, and how you got involved with getting the right banks in your store and, and how important that has been. How'd you, how'd you figure out how to do that? Um, and you know, where are you now? Okay. So one of the, uh, you know, uh, selling cars, as we all know, is a very, you know, capital intensive business. Okay. So a floor plan, you know, it's, it's, let's call it a necessary evil. I think for most people, mm. especially most people that, you know, start from zero. I mean, it would be very, it would be very hard to, uh, you know, to, to grow with any sort of, um, you reach a certain level when it's kind of hard to go anywhere further without some sort of cash infusion. Okay. Um, so, I started out with, uh, uh, with AFC, like, you know, I'm sure a lot of dealers have with AFC or next year. 
And I think that, you know, at the time, you know, when you're, when you're first getting started out, you don't really have a bank, a traditional bank is not really an option because they only want to loan money to people that don't need money. So, um, you know, I went that route. I started out with, I think my first, my first contract was maybe $200,000, I think. And then when I left, it was, they called it a, you know, a platinum dealer or whatever. And I think I was at maybe, you know, 2 million and uh, kind of a fascinating story. So um, I, uh, someone that I had known for a long time that was, uh, that worked for a different bank, um, partnered up with another guy and they, uh, were, uh, they basically started the floor plan division from a bank out of Wisconsin, first business bank. And I was actually their first customer. Okay. And they gave me, I, I, I obviously, they would kill me if I, if I said the number, but they gave me an absolutely amazing deal. Okay. And I, uh, the, my very first year with first business bank, I saved over $300,000 in interest. Mm. Fee. So it was just, it was incredible. And wow. I think that, uh, and we touched on this earlier. I really think that floor planning has really put a lot of people out of business and you really need to be careful with that because you can, you know, you can really get in over your head pretty quickly. And then before you know it, you know, you've got curtailments due every day and you've got, it's just a slippery slope that I think, yeah. and I've seen this happen to people that, you know, to people in the business, to people that I know, and they are, uh, they are, remember they're borrowing money from a real bank and they, uh, I would, I, I would call it one step down from loan sharking. And when you were actually at the store, we talked about how they even, uh, they'll even make you pay interest and charge you fees on cars that they haven't even paid for. So if you mm. buy a car from Mannheim and, you know, even if Mannheim doesn't have the title, the clock's still ticking and you're paying interest, even yeah. though this lender hasn't even wrote a check for the car yet. They're I, still I, I, I bet they are making millions of dollars a day because of that. absolutely Whoa. absolutely and i actually know somebody i can't say his name but he works uh he's a, a high level executive at next year and uh he actually has told me next year doesn't even use you know afc at least uses prime they at least tell you okay you're at prime plus two here's the fees next year actually has the audacity to make up their own next year rate that <laughs> what's that's but what that's based on nobody knows probably including them mm. but they actually you know they're charging you know, uh, uh, they're charging, you know, credit worthy people, you guys, 10, 12% interest. And these are people that, that have established businesses and are reputable people. And they're still, they're still getting away. It's charging that kind of interest. And I think we're going to, yeah, I think we're going to see that. We're going to see that more and more in the coming months. Like you said, floor plans are taking down dealers. And I think that's going to keep playing itself out over the next, you know, three to four to six months with the drop in prices, the rise in interest rates, curtailments. You had mentioned one thing, Ben, that you said some of those reps actually just get together and they decide they just need to put someone under. And so they'll just increase their audits until they can catch them out of covenant. Well, what they'll do is, so they'll they'll come in and they have different ways of doing this. But if they think that you're, uh, if they think that you're doing something or they've decided that, you know, like let's say the uh, area manager decides that, you know, you're hey. high risk. Yeah. yeah. So they might do a, a jacket audit. And then if they find, you know, that you paid off a car two days too later, this, that, or the other, then they can come in and, and, you know, they'll, you know, they can systematically basically, and let's be honest, the floor plan is the lifeline for most of the, you know, for most dealers, you know, if you mm -hmm. just floor plan overnight, you're, you're in done. A lot of trouble. you know, you're in a lot of trouble and they have the ability to do that. They really do. And something else that uh, I don't know if you guys knew this, but when, when COVID uh, when these lockdowns first took place and COVID first, you know, hit or whatever you want to call it, um, next year locked every account. So they yep, froze everybody's that. account. Well, you know, I was out, you know, literally, I spent every dollar I had because these prices fell so hard and so fast. I just knew. And I mean, I, act, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget this. I went to a CarMax sale and there were 90 cars and I bought 70 of the 90 at one sale at CarMax Dayton. In wow. March of that year, because you so, were the only one with money. No, they just everybody thought the sky was falling. I mean, oh, I think yeah. we forget, but I mean, there were a lot of people that were dumping cars at the sale. That were, you know, there were maybe on the, this is before CarMax was online, so you had to be in the lanes to buy. There mm -hmm. were five, maybe you know, six, seven people there. So, 
Ben, real quick, talk to us about the other side of the financing spectrum, the other side of the equation, right? Because you've got your flooring plan, which is really important as a dealer. But at what point did you start signing up the lenders that you needed for your customers? Like, when did you start bringing on the the banks that would that your guys could get people approved on? Because that's the whole other piece to the puzzle that dealers have to have. They've got to have a place to put this paper. How, how did you get those guys signed up? Hey, everybody, just to break in again, Primaland, we talked about it. Uh, cash is king right now. If you don't have it, you could be in some serious trouble. Um, you know, money's gotten more expensive, but I know that the people at Primaland will help you make sure that it's the right money for you and also get you through maybe one of those times where you are cash crunch and you do need the money because Jeff, you know, I'm stocking up right now and I got ahead of cash. <laughs> I am too. And I have been uh, pulling money from out of the mattress to make sure <laughs> that I can pay for the cars that I just bought today. Um, but as we talk about in this episode, it's good to have options. So even if you're happy with your bank, you're happy with your lender, your line of credit, talk to the guys at Primalin and make sure you have a backup. They might be able to give you an overflow or reserve, or at least have that conversation so they know who you are when you do call them and need them. So pretty traditional path. So, you know, we, uh, initially we started out, we were, uh, we had relationships with a couple banks, you know, local banks where we would actually have to send the customer. Uh, there's, there's a, there's a credit union, Indiana members that comes to mind that, that, that is actually the largest, I think, lien holder besides the department of revenue and maybe child support in Indiana. So they're a huge bank, but we, so we would send, send people there, but we were, we, again, we weren't getting anything for it except for maybe around Christmas time, a free lunch, who knows, you know, n- nothing of any importance. And then, you know, everybody at one point has, uh, you know, CAC Westlake, these banks that will, you know, sign up, you know, pretty much anybody. But then beyond that, we had to have financials. Uh, and, you know, I, I got CAC in Westlake after I moved to that first Carmel lot in 2010. Okay. And I, uh, uh, maybe around about 2012, 2013 is when I actually started, um, uh, signing up, you know, indirect, you know, in the industry that, you know, the term is indirect lending where now you're getting paid, you know, the bank will actually pay you to, uh, to do these loans. And, you know, you may get, you know, 2%, 3%, but it makes it much easier to sell your product, like gap, your warranty, things like that. So that, that took place, let's say, you know, I mean, it was 10 years in the business before I was able to do that. And you had to prove to these guys, you had financials, you had a track record to even get in the door and get signed up. You weren't some fly by night that was going to screw them over. So so typically they want to see two years of tax returns. And as an, Mm -hmm. as a dealer principal, you have to have, uh, and now, especially now more than ever, they're going to look at this, but they want to know that, you know, that you, you are financially, you know, financially solid. You know, they want to know that you're not a fraudster that's going to write a bunch of bad paper and, and skip town. And I think, I think, you know, we've already seen it, you know, you guys have <clears throat> seen the same stuff I have, but you know, a, a lot of banks are doing away with the indirect side right now. Have you, have you felt that? So we've only had one bank. We've only had one bank uh, that we use with any, you know, with any regularity uh, cease, cease indirect lending, but, but it is, it, it is on the horizon. I would not be surprised if we don't see more of that because really, when you think about it, they're they're paying us, you know, two, 3%, um, you know, really what's in it, what's in it for them because, you know, their money, they have to get the money as well. Um, and I think that uh, with interest rates the way they are, the incentive's just not there. And I think a lot of them are hitting pause. I think that they're, you know, uh, they're being much more cautious about. We're definitely seeing our calls are not as aggressive as what they used to be, you know. Um, and I, I just think we're seeing an inward, an inward uh, pull on, on a lot of on a lot of lending in general guys. What, what would you recommend dealers out there do to uh, prepare for that? Well, I would say, you know, number one, um, I would try to have a, uh, uh, an eclectic mix of lenders. I mean, you you know, it it doesn't hurt. You got to do business with, you know, some banks don't like it if you don't do a lot of business, you know, I mean, like certain banks, like let's say cap one, it's a tiered system. So your calls get better, the more deals you do. But I would develop relationships as a dealer principal. I would recommend getting to know 
Uh, I'd start at credit unions. They're much easier to deal with. Uh, usually you can get someone at a, at a high level, you know, uh, um, and, uh, you know, get to know them, you know, uh, take them out to lunch, introduce yourself. Uh, and then from there, and it's funny how that works because the more banks you have, you know, the more, you know, people can see that you're doing business, you know, um, and you just kind of, you, you build that up, you know, and now we've got over 30 lenders, you know, we've got national lenders, you know, we've got, you know, your cap ones, your allies, you know, things like that all the way down to, we still do business with these same credit unions that we started with 10 years ago. That's really that's, cool. I think that's a crucial, crucial piece to the puzzle when it comes to lenders, when it comes to buying sources, when it comes to flooring lines, when it comes to maybe lines of credit or things to fall back on. I think as dealers, we get so complacent and we love the simplicity of just having a single go-to that we mm -hmm. don't broaden. We're not we're always not looking to broaden we're our base and, you know, what's our insurance? Where can we go if this guy drops or that guy drops? Are we out of business? Well, here's what you need to think to yourself. You need to think to yourself, what would happen if, whether it be your floor plan, whether it be, you know, this lender, that lender, what is your plan if that ceases to exist tomorrow? And you need to have a plan. You need to have a backup, you know? And I think a lot of people, just like what you just alluded to, I think they get comfortable with, especially if it's working, you know, I mean, if something's working and something's great, you know, it's human nature. You don't really want to think about anything else, you know, yeah. and especially in banking, what happens when that one guy, you know, that one buyer that, you know, leaves, leaves the bank or gets fired, or then where do you, where do you stick, you know, these deals or that deals, you know, I mean, what, where do you stick that customer? What lender are you going to go to? You know, you, you've got to have, you, you've got to have different avenues. You've got to always have, um, you know, a plan B, a plan C, and at least as it pertains to, you know, to lenders and floor planning and things like that. Awesome. Ben, this has been great. Uh, do you, any other parting words of wisdom? I mean, there's so much we didn't get into that I really wanted to, but it's taken so much of your time. Uh, closing advice or, or, or words of wisdom for the dealers that are listening? Yeah, I would say the number one thing, you know, we haven't really touched on it. Uh, we ran out of time, but I would say, you know, your employees are going to make or break you. You know, so many times in the last, uh, um, especially as I've grown, it's been those one or two, you know, I've got the, uh, you know, I've got my best friend who you guys met, Gordon. I've got my brother, you know, I've got, I've got some people that have really, that without them, there's no way that I think that I would have made it this far that I owe, you know, so much gratitude to. And I just look back and, you know, let's say that over the years I've had, you know, 200 employees, you know, over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, you know, people come, people go, but it's those handful of people that make the difference between success and failure. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yeah. Ben, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. <laughs> Guys, it was great. Thanks a lot. Dealers helping dealers. Please leave us a review and subscribe. The Independent Dealer Podcast.